Hello, I'm Bob Phillips with Common Cause North Carolina, and today I'm on the floor of the North Carolina House, joined by Representative Rick Glazier, right at your desk, and appreciate you giving us some time. Thanks, Bob. It's my pleasure. Now, I know that, uh, and I say this with some mixed feelings, you're going to be leaving the North Carolina General Assembly for a, a position with the uh, NC Justice Center, and I want to ask you about that in just a bit. But first, I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, you are our champion, obviously, in so many of the democracy issues. Strengthening democracy is certainly our mission, and I think a lot of your work was to that end. How would you say we are in North Carolina as far as where we are with our democracy? Well, we made a lot of progress um, uh, through uh, an awful lot of the legislation that you um, and your staff promoted uh, that passed and was enacted in um, uh, the decade prior. Uh, unfortunately, I think we've um, uh, retreated and withdrawn some from what probably will be viewed as a high water mark maybe six or seven years ago. Um, there were a number of initiatives that got passed, public financing for Council of State, some local pilot public financing. We were even looking, as you remember, at legislative public financing. There were increasing transparency laws, obviously a, a comprehensive uh, ethics uh, law that that passed and that does remain um, but a number of those initiatives um, have paired back in combination with um, a retreat from 50 years of progress on voting rights um, uh, with a devastating bill that's now uh, pending in multiple courts and hopefully the vast majority of which will be struck down um, but when you move from having um, increasing access to uh, every member of our society to participate in the democratic process um, in voting by enhancing um, uh, the number of days of voting by same day voter registration by early registration of um, uh, teenagers in order to get them ready and sort of prepared to the process and systemically to think about voting um, and when all of those things are paired back um, I would say that we have uh, gone from being probably a B state to a to a, a C minus or D state, and that's um, very unfortunate. Indeed, uh, when you talk about voting rights, it seems like it should not be a partisan issue. Easy and accessible voting should be something we all want. Do these ideas to roll back come from somewhere else, or how? Do, oh, how I do think. You yeah, I yeah. think very much. I mean, I, I think it's been a national movement by some uh, ultra-conservative um, groups like ALEC um, that have um, uh, perpetuated stereotypes and myths about voting and have determined that uh, some people ought to have an easy right to vote and others ought to have more obstacles. I mean, it, it's pretty clear uh, what, what across the country and a number of states um, the restrictions on uh, voting access uh, seem very similar, and uh, uh, in politics they're rarely coincidences. And so I think that there was a concerted plan from very high levels, um, and quite frankly, particularly out of the Republican apparatus and, and those uh, large corporate um, uh, interests that support them. And that's unfortunate, because in this state at least, uh, there had been, as I suggested, a 40 to 50 year history of moving in a bipartisan way forward on voting rights access. Everything from absentee uh, capacity to enhancing military uh, overseas voters capacity. Um, and again, as we talked about, uh, outside of just the pure voting, creating more opportunities for people to run for office through public financing options. Um, and when you don't have those in combination with Citizens United and, and the very negative atmosphere of campaigning that exists, it's a real deterrent to have average citizens and to have people who have families and have careers um, to want to run for the legislature or for that matter to even run for Congress. And uh, that's unfortunate. It is. Uh, and you touch upon a lot of the, again, the problems that we see. But one more question regarding voting. Short of court finding relief there, is, is that really the only way you feel like we will eventually get voting laws back that provide e ease and access? Well, I mean, for right now, absent a change in the court composition, uh, it seems very clear that Citizens United is here to stay, and so we, you can't just sort of fold up the tents and go home and say we can't do anything until we get a new justice. Uh, that does uh, obviously make presidential determinations even more important, because at some point there will be openings and a new president will have to 
to fill those. So that, that certainly highlights the importance of voting and its effect on the court composition and the laws of the country. But I, I think there are ways around it or to, to minimize its impact um, by increasing transparency requirements, um, by increasing reporting requirements uh, for all entities, um, and, and, and by being very vigilant about that, both as a society um, and as legislators or people who are um, creating the laws and the administrative agencies, like the State Board of Elections, uh, that are required to, to run um, the elections process. So I think that um, there are ways to deal with that. I think there's also campaign ways to deal with it. That is, um, people need to start crediting uh, something besides the 10 second soundbite and the 30 second commercial. They need to go back to really having town hall meetings, to um, setting up debates in their communities, to asking people to have, uh, to come to their homes to talk to their neighborhood association. And I think the more sort of back to ground grassroots campaigning that we can do and encourage, um, the more discussions that we have with candidates uh, and the less reliance on on the you know the 30 flyers in the mail and the and the and the 15 commercials a day um, that's up to us right that's up to individuals and our communities if we're not willing to do those other things then we're going to continue to rely on the money pieces um, so we can as a society community by community create more access, require more access of candidates, more positions of candidates, more discussions substantively with candidates, or we will choose not to, and that's our choice. Yeah, again, money, as you are mentioning, being such a barrier and such a problem. But aside from that, we're the ninth or eighth largest state in America, and we have ostensibly a part-time legislature. There's no way anyone can do this and uh, live. You have to do other things. Isn't that a barrier as well? And and what we do to allow more average citizens to legitimately consider running for this public office here? Yeah, I think that that's right. I'm a, I'm a, I, I, I think a long time ago, right before the recession, there was some discussion uh, that the uh, Chamber of Commerce and the business community might be willing to form a task force to look at the legislature in a business perspective and to make recommendations uh, from the outside in. Uh, about uh, rethinking uh, the part-time legislature uh, versus a full-time, rethinking the term limits issues, rethinking session limits issues, all of the kind of governance structure here, and, and make recommendations, uh, again, from the outside. It, it, it would be much easier, I think, uh, for Citizens Commission or Business-Led Commission uh, to do that. Um, there is always the problem internally of uh, party politics playing into uh, negating one or the other, whoever's in the majority, from wanting to look at that on the theory that you'll then be attacked by the other party as it's self-serving. So that ain't going to happen, um, but it needs to happen. And I still think, whether it's common cause and uh, whether it is um, democracy, whether it is a group of advocates in combination with the business community, forming an outside commission uh, uh, that really looks at the governance of state legislatures in other states, what ought to happen here is important. And I think in the next few years it ought to happen. Um, and I think that um, it really will come to the conclusion, or likely, that the current system probably doesn't serve the state as well as it should, and certainly was a system based on what was in effect our economy and our lifestyle 100 and 200 years ago, but it bears no relationship um, to what's happening now. If we want to encourage uh, more professionals, we want to encourage a more diverse legislature, um, then we're going to have to find a way to make it a viable profession um, uh, for people and uh, at least have people be able to make a living uh, so that uh, so that it makes some sense to be paid thirteen thousand nine hundred dollars a year for what is supposed to be part time, but here we are sitting in almost September, right. starting in mid January, not an end in sight. Um, uh, it is a fairly full time, um, and I think people expect full time service back home. Uh, and if that's the expectation, and that's the uh, what we think we need to govern the ninth most populous state. Uh, then it's time to really seriously look at changing um, the composition of the legislature and how we elect it. Right. You mentioned lobbying and ethics, and that's an area where both parties, by and large, came together. Right. Certainly you were a champion of that. Um, would you say we're in good shape 
Uh, are there concerns about things being rolled back there? Uh, what do you make of whatever it has been seven or eight years after the fact? How are we there? That's a really good question. Um, so, and it, with a very complex answer, I think. Um, so the laws that are in place are really top, pretty top notch. Um, um, the willingness to enforce them, perhaps less so than five, six, seven, eight years ago. What I do see happening here is, um, I don't think there's any doubt, and I don't mean this in a degrading way, I mean it simply as a, a function of where we are in the political process. Um, it is increasingly clear to me that there is uh, a strong pay to play philosophy writ large here um, that has come back in a different form than what used to be the problem. I mean, back in the 90s and to early 2000s, the issue was um, take you to take you on a golf weekend. And that was, I don't know that it ever persuaded anyone, but it certainly created uh, the appearance of conflict and it created very discernible access differences between public and the private lobbyists. That was its own problem, and that was generally resolved by the ethics laws. Uh, what it can't be fully resolved or understood is the effect of money on access in a different way here. Uh, campaign contributions after Citizens United and increased contribution limits, uh, the necessity of raising from a House race several hundred thousand dollars to be competitive for a Senate race, sometimes over a million, for our $13,999 yeah, a year job. Um, creates a, a whole different dynamic. Um, the amount of lobbyists here, uh, I think we're one of the highest, if not the highest per capita amount of lobbyists in the country in a state capital. We've got over a thousand of them, I believe. Um, and that creates its own set of circumstances. So I, I worry a lot uh, that, that the money effect is drowning out the public interest in a broad sense here. And I um, I think you can see that playing out almost on a daily basis in the halls of the legislature. Another structural change that we've advocated, and again, you have championed, is the idea of taking the map-making responsibilities when it comes time for redistricting away from you all, the legislators, and giving it to some other entity, whether it's an independent citizens commission or maybe the nonpartisan staff as mm -hmm. Iowa has. Um, my question is, would it really matter? We are a state that's ever changing. We're going from rural to urban. And I guess there's some thought that we sort of self-determine where we live and we tend to migrate. Uh, we're Democrats and Republicans. Sure. My question is, how much would things change if we did have some kind of new way of redistricting? I think it would be uh, substantial and significant. Um, so we're not going to change housing patterns, and, and uh, but but housing patterns, uh, and, and that's and that's fine. If our districts now were contiguous and compact and based on communities of interest, they are not contiguous, compact, and based on communities of interest. Um, they are based on uh, political incumbency and party uh, majorities. I mean, and you can't help but look at the map. Um, and see the irregular shapes and forms of nearly every district, some of which, a little of which is required either by Voting Rights Act issues or that is actually sort of geographic uh, boundaries, but most of it is not. Now, my district's an exception, actually. My district is pretty compact mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to my old district, uh, and I've been in three of them since I've been here. Um, but a Senate district uh, in, my, in my county uh, looks like uh, you know, a jellyfish. I mean, and and literally, one of the Senate districts. Um, uh, I was in. Uh, I'm a House member. There was another House former House member, Diane Parfit, another former House member, Margaret Dixon. And in order to exclude us from what would normally be the district Senate district we're in, there's literally a string that comes into each of our subdivisions, grabs our street, puts it in the other Senate district, wow. so we can't be a competitor to the current senator. And that's the only parts of our subdivisions, large subdivisions, that aren't in the, now, now that, there's no rhyme or reason for except pure politics. And that's the kind of stuff uh, that needs to stop. It adds to confusion of voters. It also adds to um, uh, a lack of um, credibility of the institution. And it happens all over the state this last time. Uh, I mean, uh, Democrats certainly did their own gerrymandering 
um, but the Republican majorities this last time took, took it to a new art form, um, and I think a very illegal and unconstitutional one. The way around that uh, is what some states have done, uh, which, is, which has recently been ruled pretty constitutional. Um, but Iowa, I think, is the model that you suggested, and I think it's the best model. It's actually a model that requires non-partisan uh, uh, legislative staff to draw the plan based solely on compactness and contiguity of districts and communities of interest, unrelated to the incumbency or political party issue. Um, and then the, we get to vote uh, as a House and Senate up or down. We don't get to make changes, flip this house here and that house there. Um, and, uh, and, and that goes through a process, and, and, and hopefully after several tries, uh, uh, you adopt the plan. I mean, it's worked for 40 years now in Iowa. They have gone uh, Republican, Democrat switching pretty much every 10 years. Um, they have had no litigation, unlike North Carolina, which has litigation on every plan we've ever adopted. Um, so, and there's public confidence in Iowa that it's a good process. It doesn't mean you don't have adaptations here, as the bills would have to have. They don't have a voting rights problem uh, issue in Iowa. We, d we have voting rights districts here, even with what's left of the Voting Rights Act. Um, so I think um, there are, there are there are far more positives to doing something like that uh, than what we're doing now. And uh, would it solve all the problems? No. But would it create a more uh, competitive series of districts? Far more competitive. Right now, I'd say 20 of, maybe 25 of the houses, probably 25 of the houses, 120 districts are competitive, seriously competitive. Uh, every other, you know, the rest are split between Democrats and Republicans who will always win them because of the demographics, at least under the current demographics. Uh, in the Senate, you've got 50 seats, and you've probably got eh, maybe 8 to 10 that are competitive. Um, and that then forces enormous stress on those districts, and the money quadruples in electing someone there because they don't have to spend it on the others. Right. So you get, it, it just exacerbates the problem. And then it creates a circumstance for those other districts where you have nobody who has to fight to find a common ground or a middle the battle or the war in those districts becomes the primary, and that means in the Democratic primaries, the party faithful tend to be more on the left pulling uh, on the Republican districts more on the right, and you end up polarizing those districts, right. which creates the problem you're, in part that you're seeing in Washington and here, because there's very few people left in the middle. I would say 20 years ago, even with the Democratic gerrymandering that occurred, you had far, far more people in the middle. You found common ground easier. Um, it is dysfunctional, uh, the way we elect districts right now. And, and I think not serving, in fact, I am certain not serving the people of the state very well. Obviously, I agree with everything you said. I mean, you make the great case. So then the question is, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, it's just very tough for the majority party to, to make the move. Obviously, the current majority party still has some collective memory of what it was like to be out of power and there had been some success in getting a compromise or I should say a bipartisan bill uh, proposed, but what is it going to take really to get this done? Well, you're right, Bob. I mean, it, 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 in, in candor, I mean, this was uh, when the Democrats were in charge, they didn't want to talk about this kind of uh, nonpartisan redistricting, um, and, and, and now we do, um, or most of us do. Uh, same thing is happening with Republicans, but credit someone like Skip Stam, who's been um, uh, a, a sort of champion of this issue for when he was in the minority and when he's in the majority. And that, that kind of um, uh, ethical continuity on this issue is not, you won't find many people here that fit that bill. Right. Um, so, and it has passed the House. It had, did not pass the Senate, and I don't anticipate in this session uh, that it will. Um, but I'll tell you, coming up is, is, the, is, the, is a real opportunity because the demographics of this state are changing. Uh, not only are we, are we uh, the ninth largest and growing pretty fast, um, but the demographics of the browning of North Carolina and the graying of North Carolina really well highlighted uh, in, by, by demographers' reports for 15, 20 years now. Um, it has created, I think, some substantial uncertainty about what the, the census is going to show in districts uh, in 2020, plus the continuing move to, in, in urban and suburban areas from rural areas. Um, and so 
I think that there is enough uncertainty on what those demographics are going to show uh, that people in both parties should seize the opportunity this next session and, and get the plan in place because they um, might rue the day that they didn't. Uh, it's exactly what the Democrats are ruining now. They should, we should have done, and when we had the majority, agreed to this, and we wouldn't have seen the, the sort of revolution of districts in 2010. And the Republicans, I think, um, uh, are in a position now where they ought to do what we didn't, which is seize the day, or they may rue it in 2020, what they didn't do previously. Uh, as long as there's uncertainty, uh, it creates the climate for the change. As soon as one side or the other believes that the way the districts will be set up in 2021 um, gives them an advantage, then we lose an opportunity. We'll continue to make that case. I think you stated well. So let's talk about now where you're going. <laughs> and uh, you're still going to be working, obviously, on the issues you care about. Talk a little bit about the, that opportunity and, and the reasons that you're shifting from one place, the North Carolina General Assembly, to the NC Justice Center. Um, you know, there comes a point in time, I've served in public office now 19 years, 13 years in the House and six years on the school board. And um, the issues that have always been of major import to me are public education, uh, social justice and civil rights, um, uh, uh, consumer fairness in, 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 in the public, um, uh, and, and, and issues of, of, of fairness in tax and budget policy. Um, I've always believed that the role of, of government is to alleviate human suffering wherever possible. Um, and, and so those are the things that have been um, very much a part of, of the fabric of my legislative career that I've been very privileged and lucky enough uh, to, to, to have um, served. The opportunity for the Justice Center came open, um, not something I saw it. Um, and I've worked with colleagues from there now for 13 years here at the legislature. I happen to think it's uh, probably the most um, uh, uh, credible and, and uh, uh, an assembly of, of, of minds and intellectual um, capacity and um, compassion and spirit of any nonprofit in the southeastern United States. Um, I think that the ability the Justice Center has to um, focus in three different ways on issues of poverty and eradication of the effects of poverty in North Carolina um, is unmatched. They do it on both uh, a lobbying and advocacy side, both here and in Congress. They do it on an educational side in terms of communication to the public um, and journalistic, um, tremendous journalistic uh, uh, investigation into um, major issues. And they do it in litigation. And there aren't many organizations that have all three sort of um, um, legs of the stool to operate on. Um, and I would add that there's really a fourth leg, that, and that is direct community service to a lot of um, uh, 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 underserved populations about what their rights are, what the services are, and getting them access to their government. For me, 25% um, of the state effectively lives in poverty. Um, uh, it looks just shy of that, but and over 25% of the kids. Um, those effects are pervasive, they are generational, and they are unnecessary. We have the capacity as a state to be far better than we are and to give everybody access to equal opportunity in the state. We don't do that now. Um, I view the Justice Center as one of the prime, if not the major mechanism um, um, in the state to make serious inroads um, to affect those numbers. And I, uh, I can't think of a better set of colleagues I'd want to work with. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to be um, the executive director of the Justice Center, which, as I said, I think is, is truly one of the best nonprofit think tanks in the country and certainly in the southeastern United States. Well, it's certainly been a privilege for Common Cause North Carolina to have a great relationship with the NC Justice Center. We're happy you're going there. I'm going to miss not having uh, you here, but we're glad you're not going uh, very far. And I guess, uh, lastly, I mean, I know you have mixed feelings yourself. Um, there are going to be some things that you'll always carry with you here. This has been a great experience, I gather. It has. It's been an you know, experience of a lifetime and shy of, of my family. Um, in a sense, the greatest passion and, and love that I have is, is having been able to um, be a part of a public policy process here that I think is, has done, I hope, has done some good uh, for folks. I will miss the relationships here. You, I'm going to keep those as a person and, and in a new role at some point as a lobbyist. 
but it is different. Um, and so, and any job you're at, it's about the people you're working with and their relationships. And so I have a tremendous number of friends here. I will miss uh, the day-to-day -day participation in, in trying to, to make policy a little bit better. Um, but, you know, that's the one thing, I guess, that's been interesting in moving from eight years and being in the majority to five years in the minority. Your role shifts. You have a different responsibility. Um, same idea of making the state better. Well, now I'm going to be in a new position and the role shifts. But I have the same responsibility to work with 46 people uh, to help influence policy in a different way um, and to make lives better for people in the state. And, you know, that's the legacy we all want to leave, right? I mean, uh, plant the trees for the next generation. And um, so, uh, new chapter in life. Well, you've done it well here. Yes. And uh, I was going to bring a Common Cause t shirt, but we have this little <laughs> not thing of value. So I guess I might have to wait on that. But I'll just say on behalf of Common Cause, uh, thank you and the democracy community. Thank you for everything you've done, it championing our issues we care about. And obviously, um, we wish you the very best. Thank you. It's Justice been Center. absolutely an honor and pleasure working with you. And uh, uh, no group has done more to champion the issues of. Uh, as we talked about transparency and improvement in democracy and access um, to populations uh, across the state than, than common cause and democracy. And um, we made some good get gains. And, we uh, have. And uh, the things that we backtracked on will change in the next few years, I hope. I hope so, too. Thank you again. Thanks.